Greetings. I'm Richard Lowenberg, and this is Arts and Sciences Telluride 2024. Named that because uh, 45 years ago, I put on Arts and Sciences Telluride 1979. Uh, and uh, today, uh, we're having the, right now, we're about to begin the 10th of our laser uh, Leonardo laser zooms in this series. There's two more to go after today, uh, one tomorrow on Thursday and one on Friday. Um, the program's been going really well. It's an inspiring group of people and an inspiring uh, uh, amount of contact, uh, of, uh, of information and presentation that uh, some of our observers have said, uh, I am seeing the future. Uh, and that's, an, I think, a nice way to look at this session. Uh, today, we have a very special connection with SIGGRAPH, the special interest group in graphics of the ACM. Uh, and I think this is its 51st year. Is that right, uh, Everardo? Uh, yeah, the premier computer graphics conference in the world, a large program that's happening as we speak in Denver this week. Uh, and I'm really grateful that with uh, uh, Everardo's help, Everardo Reyes, I'll introduce a little further in a moment. He's the special projects director at SIGGRAPH this year. He's primarily based in Paris. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, the primary presenters today are Everardo Reyes, Tamiko Thiel, Gustavo Rincon, and Helen Nicole, better known as Eleni Costis. And uh, I, I don't want to uh, be uh, taking too much time myself, so I'm immediately going to hand it over right now to Everardo Reyes. Take it away, Everardo. Thank you very thank much, you. Richard. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, to everybody for being here and the invitation. I hope that, um, well, uh, we are close, uh, not that far from Telluride, we're in Denver. So uh, I would like to share my presentation now. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo and Richard. So yes, as uh, Richard was saying, uh, we are having this week uh, in Denver, celebrating the 51st anniversary of SIGGRAPH. Uh, let me tell you a little bit what, what uh, just um, give, give you some more details about what Richard said about SIGGRAPH, just to contextualize a little bit what we are, uh, what we have been uh, presenting, working, listening to, discovering, learning here in Denver. And then I think that that would help also to contextualize the um, the background of our uh, uh, guests and speakers and uh, what we also try to uh, contribute to the conference and to this of course special event which also includes uh, laser i am very happy to 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 be sharing this uh, stage with good friends from laser so first as um uh, richard said perhaps i would like maybe very briefly contextualize what is SIGGRAPH because um, as uh, Richard said, it's part of an association. It's indeed is, SIG means a special interest group. So SIGGRAPH, that means it's an interest group among other 30 special uh, interest groups at this Association for Computing Machinery. It's one of the oldest. 77 years working at the intersection of computing uh, technologies and uh, recently or well, more more uh, let's say explicit and directly involved into the applications of computing technologies and the impact or uh, features or effects in or across uh, disciplines and of course um, uh, the world and the uh, current uh, situation problems, applications that we can 
where computing science can be can be used, right? So of course, at that time in 1947, we couldn't perhaps difficult, uh, not easily predict what the amount or the impact of computing technologies is today. And uh, well, talking about uh, computing today is almost like evident. Everybody has a computer in uh, the pocket of, right? Everybody. So um, among all those inter special interest groups, there is one which is called as as we are talking today, CIGRAP, Special Interest Group on Computing, Computer Graphics and Interactive Techniques, is one of the largest, one of the biggest uh, interest groups, 50 years now. There are others, of, of course, other uh, uh, um, cousins or, or uh, sibling uh, special interest groups. Among all of among them, I will cite maybe, maybe only two. There is SIGCAI, Special Interest Group in human computer interaction or there is sig web a special interest group on hypertext and web technologies so sigraph is about computing computer graphics uh visual computing it's about uh interactive techniques that's so if you think what we can do together is we are talking about virtual reality it is uh, more recently as you know since 2022 about uh generative media we 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 uh, do see and hear a lot of research and interest, uh, not only by uh, uh, long term, long long time uh, professors and uh, practitioners, but also, of course, new generations are like even uh, let me say it like this: taking for granted that, of course, we'll have uh, uh, generative media and artificial intelligence from now on. Right? It's gonna be uh, going to stay with us. So what can we, that was the question when we started working this program one year and a half ago. So uh, this year, 2024, uh, the conference chair, uh, um, whose name is Andres Burbano, originally from Colombia, from the artistic uh, community. I've been working, I have the pleasure of having working with him. I will tell you a little bit what we have been working in the context of art and science. So uh, he had this very interesting vision of uh, 2024, where he said, mm, why don't we think about the impact of computer graphics at different scales, right? Different scales of our um, involvement in um, not only, of course, uh, uh, other human beings uh, or the immediate environment, but what else? So uh, this what else goes from the microscopic to the body, to the environment, to the city, to the cosmos. And as he said also, bigger than the cosmos would be human imagination, right? With, with uh, uh, what all these possibilities that we want not only to predict, that is something very interesting, Not we don't want to predict, but rather project. What can we think that would be a possible, a desirable future, and how can we make it happen, right? So thinking about this thematic, these uh, thematic scales, uh, conference chair invited some keynote speakers, and uh, I just... Uh, I am showing you the, the 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 names and the photos of our of this year keynote speakers. Today, I wanted to 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 tell you that we had uh, the uh, talk by uh, Professor Manu Prakash from Stanford University, who um, really uh, inspired us from the microscopic level, right? It was very interesting to see also that yesterday, uh, Professor Dave Van Newman, who uh, is the director of the MIT Media Lab, was also talking about the cosmos. So if you, uh, maybe uh, the first, uh, or one of the, the first uh, impressions or perceptions to have is that cosmos and micro uh, microscopic would be like very different or very, very far. Uh, from uh, uh, a scale perspective, but indeed, uh, it's uh, they share 
a lot of commonalities, of course. It was very interesting to hear today uh, by uh, Manu Prakash how uh, is uh, what what we are experiencing today is that this complex relationship between extinction of species, a rapid extinction of species, insects in Europe, but at the same time, thanks to uh, some discoveries, technical uh, uh, instruments and science, of course, we are discovering more and more different organisms at the microscopic level, and it's like a complex relationship. So, um, uh, what I want to say is that, of course, uh, um, this uh, keynote was recorded. So as far as I can tell you, I think it's going to be open to everybody to access and to revisit uh, the, 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 the content. So I hope that I will uh, share uh, soon uh, the link or the, the, the way in which you can like see again that special uh, com um, keynote address. Right. So, well, just to 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 keep things going more uh, rapidly, I uh, will tell you that um, I my particular participation in this edition was, as Richard said, a special projects. So, what is this about? It is about thinking about how can we see differently the content, all the content that we have in in, in the conference, more than. 700, 800 contributions, right? Among all of them, 16 particularly talk about science or scientific. They use those words in the abstract of the contribution, right? So I don't I don't want to go uh, to, to put uh, uh, to spend more time in this because there is this website that we, um, well, there is this content in form of a website that it's accessible on site at the conference. We have a, a special uh, place and screen where you, where everybody can, can, can come and, 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 and discover names, keywords, content. So this is one that you can also explore at home. And uh, among these special projects, there is one which is called the next 50 years. And the idea was to invite uh, art and science related people, colleagues, friends to address a message about what would be their desirable future, the desirable projection about technologies, computer graphics, interactive techniques, and science um, in the next 50 or even 100 years. So if you want to check that, we have some uh, a list of uh, first participants. Of course, this can be, uh, uh, this can grow up uh, in time. You are all, you welcome, of course, to participate. And um, I think that's it. I'm going to conclude. I'm sorry, because this is going to be like wasting uh, uh, completely the, my discourse this afternoon. But I just wanted to briefly tell you that uh, one of the things that I've been doing related to art and science is a project that we call Hydrology of Media, right? And by coincidence, it's something that I started working with Andres Burbano, conference chair of, of SIGGRAPH. Mm, four years, five years ago. So what I wanted to say is that we have this website that is also uh, always evolving. And what will you have here is some content, some resources about field work, about uh, uh, pedagogical uh, work that we, we've been doing with workshops around the world on water. How do we conceive? How do we uh, relate? How can we uh, communicate, what can we do with, uh, what can we think with water at our level from, with our own instruments, with our own knowledge, and we uh, restitute this in form of a uh, workflow so that we can share and that we can reproduce, redo, remix in different uh, contexts. So I'm sorry, this is only a brief introduction. I wanted to really just tell you briefly that what I've been doing. And of course, I hope I'll have more more opportunities and please stay in touch. I'll be happy to, to, to continue sharing with you more information. Thank you, Richard. No, thank you, Everardo. Uh, that was a great introduction to SIGGRAPH and this year's program specifically. And uh, uh, I wanna move along and uh, our next presenter 
uh, I feel very honored. Uh, I think we're all really honored to have Tami Cotil join us. She is uh, at SIGGRAPH this year, uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, awardee at SIGGRAPH uh, for a remarkable uh, body of work over many years uh, and uh, around the world, actually, uh, as her career and her work has uh, uh, really uh, influenced and uh, set a high bar for the work in computer graphics, AR, VR, XR, and uh, very likely uh, what's uh, many uh, iterations of what's next. Uh, so without further ado, Tommy Cotil. Um, talk just about uh, two projects. Oh, thanks, uh, Richard, for that introduction. Um, if I ever um, have money to hire a PR person, you're top on my list. <laughs> so, um, but I'm going to go right into the uh, this um, uh, talk about this project. Uh, th these are I'm going to show a couple of my most recent projects. Uh, Atmosphere. Uh, I started working on this project on the changing nature of the Earth's atmosphere as I was trying to grapple with. Uh, with the issues of climate change and all of these cycles um, that are necessary to say, sustain life on our planet and just dealing with the fact that, for instance, these three gases that you uh, that you see here are are uh, very important, uh, CO2, methane, and O2, oxygen. And we, we certainly know uh, um, that we, we and plants have this very, uh, tight uh, relationship between, you know, we need O2 to breathe. Uh, we, we breathe out uh, CO2. The plants take in CO2 and they produce, you know, um, food for us and oxygen. But these are all um, invisible gases. So I, I thought back to my days as a chemistry student in high school and thought of the Lewis structures that, I, that you see here where the atoms... Uh, and the electrons are arranged then to show uh, a lot of the structure of the molecule. So that makes immediately, of course, makes the these different gases identifiable. And that's what I used as particle systems in the piece atmosphere. So you see a photograph here of of the initial version, uh, which is uh, part of, which is a um, commission from Cristiano Paul, who. Um, uh, her her main job is being the uh, media art curator at the Whitney Museum in, in New York, but she was moonlighting as the curator for the Demoda Virtual Museum uh, platform number four point one, and um, and commissioned this piece. So uh, I've got a couple of brief excerpts, and this, for instance, is uh, is the pro protoplanetary gas out of which the uh, the um, uh, the solar system arose, and and here you can see on on the still that that all of these different gases are are mostly um, noxious and poisonous ones to us. And the whole piece is nine minutes. I'm jumping now from pretty much near the beginning to here, very close to the end, where um, the planet has evolved. Uh, life has miraculously somehow appeared on the Earth uh, as in the form of protocells. The protocells have also miraculously somehow evolved to be cyanobacteria, which are single cell, little green single cells that are what make plants green. And they generated oxygen, brought about the oxygenation event where, uh, which produced the um, atmosphere that we need with all of this oxygen. And then here you see the Onyx Studio in, in New York, uh, me testing out for the first time uh, the piece as an immersive space. And I really hope to be able to show it that way so that more people can see it simultaneously, not be restricted to a single person. But that's the phase when, then when, um, when the uh, you know we've started the Anthropocene in in the in the in the in the, in the previous um, uh, slide, and then. 
uh, started burning the fossil fuels and are bringing back actually many of the gases that were in the perfect planet, I guess, we're putting them in our own atmosphere. So from, from sort of an engagement of, of trying to understand a lot of my artwork, starts from the place of me wanting to understand something about the world that I don't really fully comprehend. And then I do research onto it. I did a lot of um, internet research to, to understand what was happening at different uh, phases in the development of the earth and then visualizing it in some way that makes sense to me and that I think communicates that information to other people. And so here's a, a piece that I'm working on now with a, a very similar Lewis structure aesthetic, but it's a mixed reality piece. You can see in the live uh, video recording there, there are four bowls. Each of them has one of the classical Greek, Greek elements, air, fire, water, um, uh, earth. And you're, you're wearing a VR helmet. And when you touch a bowl, as you can see the person doing that, releases a substance from that bowl into the virtual world and if you you know if you're looking at the um the screen recording here you see that he's also uh, come very far along in the evolution of the earth there's um ah but fire has arisen so there's the uh, cyanobacteria underneath uh, him in the water it's releasing oxygen um, but the oxygen is what allows open flames to come. Open flames uh, um, is at some level the start of the Anthropocene when we start being able to use uh, the, the open flames to, sm uh, to smelt, to, uh, to burn, uh, to cook. It also helped our evolution, the evolution of our brains, but at some level is also the beginning of the anthropocene process that has now come along very very far so um so these two pieces especially i'm, I'm hoping to show around a lot people have um, uh, reacted very positively to be showing this prototype i've gotten uh, contact to a astrophysicist named graham lowell who um, works with uh, um, different parts of NASA as, uh, and that is very interested in sort of public facing uh, um, works that explain uh, uh, the science of uh, astrophysics, astrobiology to people. And, um, so I'm hoping that um, he can vet this piece within um, the next couple of weeks and I can produce the final version, submit it to um, to the art festival most and also um, probably the right place to try and bring it is to science museums uh, where um, there's uh, hopefully a high uh, tolerance for the vulgarities of virtual reality uh, because people really do get very afford one one little eight-year-old girl um, just explained i'm learning infinite knowledge after after going through this piece and you know, that's not quite true, but, but it's kind of a, a nice feeling that um, obviously it really engaged her with, uh, with the science. So I'm going to leave it at that and stop sharing. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tomiko. Uh, actually, I was hoping for more. I'm, I'm uh, entranced. <laughs> So, but uh, Tamiko has a plane to catch uh, this evening uh, and we don't want to keep her. Uh, let's see, before I introduce the next person, I just want to look in the chat mode. Uh, there's some comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, this was uh, lots of compliments so far. Uh, next, we have uh, Gustavo Rincon and Gustavo's uh, based at the University of California, Santa Barbara, primarily these days. And we look forward to what he's about to uh, uh, gift us with. Uh, why, thank you very much. It is uh, insane here at Seagraph. Um, I just saw a robot dog just walk by with thousands of people behind. So I think that's the craziness here. Let me share my slides. So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Gustavo Rincon. 
and I am a part of the Allosphere Research Group. And uh, I want to I want to thank um, everyone involved in this. Uh, I want to especially thank my host and all of my fellow speakers. So today the talk will um, is titled "New Media Architectures at ACMC Graph." Um, and let's begin. Uh, new Media Architectures is basically uh, a new field of research. It's coming out of my dissertation. And I'm looking at the intersection between uh, information and materiality. This has been uh, tracking how my research is progressed, looking at the future of technology, but in between thinking about cinema, thinking about the the interfaces and the instruments I've designed throughout the years with the Allosphere Research Group. So Allo Portal is one of them. The Allosphere is the instrument that I am working on, uh, working um, currently at with the director, Dr. Joanne Kachara-Marin. And I will show a video of that probably a little bit later. Here's the Allosphere uh, website. You can go to it. It'll actually show some of the video that I'm going to show and all of our research. This is the allosphere. This is entering in the second floor. So if you see the top, the bottom is very similar, except uh, under the bridge, the projectors are peeking up. You see the projectors in the front. There's three, three rings of speakers. This is our project at TED. So Chris Anderson from TED came to the allosphere, visited and said, can you make a little slice of it? So we did. This is our current project, uh, Sketches of Sensorium, that's going to debut for Pacific Standard Time. This is some of the work that I am um, co-directing for Digital Futures, which is a project that is um, education as a human right. So we have over 6 million views in many different languages, workshops, uh, uh, panels, lectures. Um, there's a doctoral consortium as well that is um, that is uh, taught by uh, Professor Neil Leach. Here's the team. This is uh, one of the initiatives. We're trying to put little courses together. So it's the introduction to AI. And you can see some of the speakers here. I'll go quickly. This is a class that I'm uh, developing with a co-instructor Dr. Uh, Joshua Dickinson. He has a company in AI and audio. Uh, kind of my focus is AI and world making. That's kind of the focus of the class. I integrated my dissertation into the class. Now we're going into C-Graph. This is, uh, Everardo did a great job, so I won't uh, go, um, I won't go over it. My role uh, in this is for the Digital Arts Committee at ACM. So we're looking at, uh, we're part of a year round um, part of the program of CGRAPH. So I'll read it briefly. The mission of the ACM CGRAPH Digital Arts Committee is to foster year round engagement and dialogue within the digital, electronic, computational and media arts. We facilitate dynamic scholarship and creative programming within the ACM CGRAPH organization. Our goal is to promote collaboration between artists and the larger computer computer graphics and interactive techniques community. Here's my committee. Here's our website. These are the programs that we had this year. Just give you a little peek. We're almost done. Our major uh, initiative is a Sparks Talks, and uh, you can see from the selection. There's a wide variety of talks. We've had uh, two great sessions on robotics. We had a pioneering session, a queer uh, digital arts now section. We had a sneak peek of the CGRAPH um, yeah. conference. And I would actually check that out if you're interested, not only to get a sneak peek, but just to understand what's going on. And that would be good for students and probably people new to CGRAPH. You can find uh, the Sparks talks online. It's usually 
We call for proposals. It's eight to 10 speakers per session. This is the talk that I uh, was organizing and initiated. The Future of Speculative Arts and Design Research Theory and Practice. It's um, kind of evolving and looking forward um, past my dissertation topic of new media architectures, but focused on the materiality and um, kind of the mixed reality part of it. Here are the organizers, my two esteemed colleagues, Bavleen Kaur and Virginia Melnick. This is uh, the first picture uh, that I'm showing of the conference, but this is Bonnie who's leading the Sparks talks. Right next to her on the left is uh, Rebecca, who's the chair, and Victoria, who's been uh, long associated with ACMC Graph. Uh, I just wanted to show you this. This is one of my favorite talks. It's uh, the Art Gallery Artist Talks. So uh, this year, what I'm hopefully can secure is another round of Artist Talks for 2024. So I like initiating these talks because I like actually having the lines between uh, academia, community, or community and professional service. Um, I like having access uh, and open education for everyone. Second part is we do exhibitions. So uh, we've had three this, uh, we've had three, but actually four. Speculative Futures is an online um, student competition with collaboration with ISEA. The Future of Reality, that's an exhibition I'm collaborating with and co-curator -cur uh, with Victoria. And uh, New Media Architectures, my colleague Johannes uh, de Young and uh, Dr. Maiza Laurent Hickson. Uh, this is kind of a preview of the speculative futures and all the artists that were chosen. The digital exhibition, uh, the Monuments for the Pluriverse, uh, that is a. Um, a show that's going to be featured at the Getty, and that presentation was made today. It's actually uh, part of the research of Dr. Uh, Liliana Constant Gallegos. Um, stay tuned. This is a New Media Architectures exhibition. There's my colleague, uh, um, Johannes de Young. This picture represents what we went for. It is uh, nine sites in the Denver Theater District. Our main show was uh, the clock tower here that you see presently in front of you. And the eight other sites are billboards. So to the immediate right, you can see one of the billboards that is horizontal. Uh, that show will be going through August the 6th uh, at Denver. This is one of the pieces from last year's ACMC graph, which is the time tunnel or the synaptic time tunnel. And that was something that I was a part of a super group with UCSB and with Bonnie and many other uh, contributors, faculty and volunteers. This is a sample of what happened in the time tunnel. You can see to the upper left, the setup to the upper right, uh, a child and his family inter interacting with the ground. On the lower left is Bonnie's team and the expression of the time tunnel and all the archives. And to the right is a dancer within the interactive space of the synaptic time tunnel. This is my last slide. This is kind of what I wanted to summarize. But in short, this is kind of my research and I'm putting it all together and really just trying to interact with the Seagraph family. I'm very humbled and uh, I look forward to do more. So I'm gonna share, uh, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So I will show some video. Alice Fair Research Facility, which is in Ealings Hall in the California Nanosystems Institute. 
we know how to represent information, very complex mathematics, in ways that most people don't even realize. So if we work with our domain scientists to represent their information, maybe together we can try to tackle what's happening right now because information is becoming so large, so complex, so hard to hold on to. How can we make a language that will allow us to be able to inform ourselves about this information? What would it be like if you could generate, control, and transform very complex information like quantum mechanics and fluid dynamics, the way a composer or an artist makes a work of art? What if you could use all of your senses to perceive this information intuitively and as second nature? And what if we could make the computer, a natural extension of ourselves. Could we actually make a creative computational language? So I will share the next video. So this is our project uh, that we're currently working on, Sketches of Sensorium, but this is our colleague that passed away before the piece was finished, and that's uh, eco-artist uh, Newton Harrison. So this will be a brief. It happened that at the end of almost a 60 year career of working with ecological issues, I began to work with the world ocean and it developed a voice and the voice spoke for itself. And I had no place for this voice to be heard until I met Joanne here. And I, I met the instrument that she's worked at. And if you look, I'm not sitting in a normal place. I'm sitting in a place of immersion. And, the new, and, I, and from it will emerge and is emerging and you will see emerge a new narrative for the world ocean. And the core of the narrative is an honorable debate between science and art, where they turn out to be of co-equal value to each other. And the one expression does not ha happen in the absence of another. Actually, one is looking at weaving, and the science and the art weave together, as you will see, and the one supports the other, and the one is the voice of the other, until finally, you're not sure which is which, nor should you be. Absolutely. Uh, video number three. So this was this year's um, part of the um, Denver Knights. So I'm going to have um, Dr. Miza Laurent uh, Hickson describe a little bit of the curatorial process. The ad campaigns, uh, the artwork, AI generated panoramic. So many incredible submissions from AI generated panoramas of melting polar ice caps to glitchy vintage commercials that satirize Colorado ski ad campaigns. Uh, the artworks in new media architectures re signify the commercial Denver Theater District as an innovative stage for public art. Shown on static and LED screens located throughout the downtown area, over 30 artists mobilized the architectural scale displays as sites for digital imagery that stimulates urgent environmental and cultural discourse. Whereas companies normally promote their own names and products on billboard screens to appeal to individual consumers, in this exhibition, Contemporary artists present their dynamic aesthetic visualizations for non-commercial purposes and street level reflection. 
walking, biking, or driving to gaze up at each illuminated display, audiences will be immersed in a live urban theater where art, technology, and the body collide to reperform civic place. And I want to thank the Seagraph Digital Arts community for this opportunity to be a part of the curatorial committee. And I'd like to congratulate all of the artists whose works will be on display. This exhibition represents the best in new media art. Congratulations. Uh, I have one more video to share and hopefully it'll work. just wanted to conclude that um, my journey in academia has been, has gone through art, architecture, through practice, and now through this PhD, and afterwards as a postdoc uh, for the Alice Fair Research Group. But now I'm looking at new territories with ACMC graph and trying to fold everything together into a very strong, united, joyful, driven community for change. I wanted to thank everyone, especially Richard for inviting me. Uh, Everardo, we celebrated his birthday last night. So uh, happy birthday again, Everardo. And uh, thank you again, if you have any questions. The first video was um, Dr. Joanne Kachamarin on the bridge of the Alisphere. The second video was uh, Dr. Joanne Kachamarin in conversation with um, uh, Newton Harrison uh, with the uh, Sensorium project. And we're doing sketches of Sensorium for the Getty, uh, which will open later this month. The third video was our curator, uh, Dr. Lor uh, Maiza Laurent Hickson for the Denver Knights um, kind of theater district exhibition with the clock tower. And the final video was the synaptic time tunnel that was last year's surprise exhibition that was sponsored by Autodesk. And it happened because we all believed in each other and we wanted to do something different based on research that combined art and science. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, and actually, I'd like to just highlight a couple of terms. Gustavo moved very quickly through some of the early part of his presentation, and uh, he ref referred to some uh, some terms that I, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with. So I, I'll uh, mention them, and if Gustavo wants to elaborate a little bit, that would be helpful. Uh, sure. What was allosphere? The allosphere uh, is a unique, uh, uh, immersive, uh, experiential environment at uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. It's, uh, uh, there are many other places now that are uh, uh, constructing and designing uh, various kinds of immersive media and informational environments, uh, really right. look at information, not just as two or three dimensional, but as uh, really time-based and spatial 
and uh, and experiential in many ways. And in fact, uh, throughout our presentations, we're also hearing language being developed to discuss these uh, uh, visual and sensory uh, practices. Uh, and it's fascinating, and we can talk about that a little later, uh, that just the whole uh, growth of uh, of our language, of semantics, of uh, of uh, how we describe and express these new experiential uh, involvements and understandings, and uh, where we're going with those, since we're still in very early development of uh, such uh, such environments. So. That's the allosphere, and, and Gustavo can talk a little bit more about it if he wants. I also want to mention, uh, Gustavo mentioned ISEA, uh, the International Society of Electronic Arts, big annual conference somewhere uh, in the world every year. This past, uh, recent past, it was in Brisbane, Australia. Um, and uh, it's a great program. It's very complementary to SIGGRAPH in some ways uh, and to the international academic, especially the academic environment uh, of uh, of the kind of things we're describing here. Uh, and the other term I wanted to uh, talk about was uh, Pacific Standard Time, PST, uh, a very uh, large and elaborate uh, art, science, technology, and society initiative in Southern California, beginning just around now and through next year and largely funded by the Getty Foundation uh, uh, at over $20 million for many, many facilities, universities, galleries, Jet Propulsion Lab, others, all participating in this Southern California uh, series uh, of uh, programs, events, and participation. Uh, anything I've left out, Gustavo, on that, those few terms? No, you are amazing, Richard. Um, I think the only thing that I would say is that for the Allosphere, it, uh, just to be clear, it is at uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, at the California Nanosystems Institute. It is based on Dr. Joanne Cochera Marin's research. She has been a professor now for 40 years. Uh, she is a force of nature. Um, she inspires us to move things forward. The time tunnel was also a part of my research is taking that expression of the allosphere and moving it into different types of paradigms, very similar to the TED installation. So TED, you saw one wall uh, that was 30 feet long by I think nine or 10 feet high. The time tunnel, they were both 150 feet long, 25 feet apart and 14 and a half feet high. And that was one of the, what I understand, it was that was one of the first times that um, I guess in the art context, we raised so much money with partnerships with Autodesk because they wanted to do something new and they wanted to do research, art and research. So, and I think that's my focus with DAC and Seagraph is how to bring those things together. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I'll just mention uh, one more, just because they deserve so much credit, they're no longer with us, but Helen and Newton Harrison, uh, remarkable artists, uh, environmental and ecosystem explorers, teachers, influencers. Uh, thank you for showing uh, Newton Harrison there in his late years, uh, but they were so, so important and influencing of many of us. Uh, yeah, Newton was an inspiration. And the only thing I can say is if you go to our website, uh, the uh, foundation has gladly made available his last big book, the big tome of Newton Harrison. So you can go to our website and download it. I think it's a few hundred pages, but you get to see Newton and Helen's work. And that was a part of, um, that is a gift, I think, that the center has given to everyone. And we hope to open the Allosphere for the next four to five months. And everyone is welcome. So, Richard, please come by. And everyone at uh, Leonardo, please come on by. Take care. Thank you, Gustavo. Let's move right away. And I, I'm really personally pleased to meet and uh, have uh, Eleni Helen Nicole Costas, uh, 
and uh, she's with the NASA and other agencies, uh, Earth Imaging Laboratory, and some other involvements that I think are really crucial for our uh, overwhelming need to address some grand challenges on this planet. And the work she's involved in is going to be a, a great aid in that process. So Eleni, take it away. Can you can you see me? We can see you and we can see your presentation. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Richard. Um, I'm Helen Nicole Costis. I'm a data visualization designer and developer uh, serving the NASA agency over the last 16 years. Um, related to SIGGRAPH, uh, I'm going to share here some work that we are showing at the conference this year. Um, right now on my screen, I'm sharing a, a still image from a data-driven uh, visualization uh, that is showing actually tonight at the Computer Animation Festival. It has been accepted and it's showing, um, it's demonstrating a state-of-the-art model, visualizing uh, sources of tagged CO2. Um, I would like to give a little bit of information uh, about my background. Uh, my background uh, is in mathematics, uh, and then I did graduate studies in computer science uh, and uh, a master's in fi uh, fine arts at the Electronic Visualization Laboratory. In addition, I would like to share some uh, work that we're going to show tomorrow um, at a production session called Visual Data Stories, the Making of NASA's Earth Information Center. Um, uh, so public exhibits. And um, in uh, October 2022, the concept of the Earth Information Center was announced by NASA Administrator Bill Nelson with a goal to consolidate data from U.S. federal agencies on how our planet is changing and bring to the hands of policymakers and local and state uh, um, uh, officials, uh, but also to the general public, data to prepare for climate change and environmental challenges across the country. So uh, this Earth Information Center is hosted on the website called earth.gov, and it serves as a gateway also to other interagency efforts, such as the Greenhouse Gas Center. Um, the, the center has also a physical presence. Uh, it has the virtual infrastructure, bucket infrastructure that aims to bring all this data together, the cyber infrastructure, but also it has a physical manifestation and it is located the first instance of that at NASA headquarters in Washington, DC. Since the time the center was announced, we had six months to bring the, the, the physical uh, exhibits uh, to life. And um, here you can see on June, 2023, where um, the NASA administrator, Bill Nelson, is cutting actually the ribbon <laughs> for the launch of the center. The, the, the physical manifestation uh, includes public exhibits uh, that communicate how our planet is changing, aim to engage audiences, but also uh, serve as talking points when people from the Congress and world leaders are visiting uh, NASA headquarters and NASA leadership. Uh, we had a big team uh, across the agency, uh, mainly from our studio where I'm based, the Scientific Visualization Studio, and the studio at JPL uh, to design, develop, and build uh, these exhibits. There are um, mainly three exhibits uh, featured, and there is an immersive space called Space for Earth. It's an interactive environment with interactive data visualizations. It's a narrated seven minute video, uh, piece uh, narrated by two astronauts that actually did spacewalks. 
And then we have the hyperwall that you see on the bottom of this image, uh, which I'm gonna go into detail. And we have also to the right, you can see a, a data sculpture uh, that is interactive and shows flow from the space network satellites. And it's developed by Dan Good uh, at JPL. Uh, I'm gonna present be presenting tomorrow at 4.15 at SIGGRAPH, a production session with Dan Good. Um, now, uh, I would like to show you a video so that you can get a glimpse of the Kuiperwool system, uh, which uh, is kind of like my project. So uh, I'm responsible for designing, developing, creating content that is featured on that wall. It's a bigger than life LED 8K display. Um, that also has two side circles and features data dashboards, as you can see right now, um, but also narrated video pieces of 8K resolution, along with all inspiring um, data-driven scientific visualizations that um, I lead and develop, uh, along also with other team members. Um, now, very early on, became very clear that um, you know the challenge of designing and creating uh, these the content uh, for the hyperwall system. Um, this thirty-two by nine wide aspect ratio format um, that needed to host near real time data, and therefore science and therefore visualized content that would be updated um, uh, showing the latest data available and data come from various sources, including satellite observations, uh, models, that means computer models that run on supercomputers at our center, along also with uh, ground observations from various agencies. So this required um, defining an approach, not only how to bring in data, how to approach various themes to showcase uh, um, the various concepts, phenomena, indicators, fields, but also design this in such a way that um, uh, content could be viewed, uh, experienced, uh, and absorbed by the scientific community, NASA leadership, but also for the public. So the challenge was big. And very early on, um, I, I realized that this wide format served as a canvas, literally, to display visually rich data visualization, uh, data visualizations developed by teams across the agency. So here I'm, I'm going to just provide a glimpse of the design strategy and layout uh, that I had to put together, create a taxonomy that allowed me also to think about the content and the resources that we would uh, allow in order to, to bring these visualizations to, and data dashboards to life. So for example, in the hero content, we would put, we would um, bring in content that is central uh, for the theme that we're talking about. So for example, for Earth Now, data dashboard, when we talk about models, then we really need to visualize and show the latest models available um, that we develop overnight on the supercomputer. And we pull them directly on the display. And then on the Knowledge Hub, uh, we will pull evergreen content from teams to relate, um, to showcase content relevant to Earth Now. So for example, here in the image, you can see that um, we are pulling the image of the day from the Earth Observatory that is that publishes every day a science story. And we even uh, pull in the vital signs from climate.nasa.gov um, by showing the vital indicators um, for the wealth of our planet, the health of our planet. And then for the specialized use, 
this is kind of an interesting uh, approach. You know, we are having a, a side circle display, which basically, if you think about it, it is a 4K LED display covered by a physical mask to look like a circle. But here we would have the opportunity to, to experiment for the first time. And in such a project allow us to continue uh, experimenting and defining visual metaphors in the field. So for example, a side circle display over here immediately brought to my mind when we had to visualize sea level rise and annual data, let's say from 1993 to 2000 to 2022, I thought about how about we approach it as a, a porthole that you would experience on a ship or a submarine. So here you see um, an actually data-driven scientific visualization um, that looks um, as you are experiencing a, a portfolio. Um, now, here you, in addition also, with the more traditional data dashboards, we wanted to experiment and first of all, develop visualizations with state-of-the-art models, We're working very closely with science teams, uh, but also experiment with a visual representation um, of the model, but also of the data dashboard. So here um, you see one of our favorite data dashboards and one of our most complex visualizations that uh, showcase um, the GEOS model developed by the Global Modeling Assimilation Office, visualized by our group, that we can see the different layers and sources of carbon dioxide uh, over uh, a single year. Now, on my end, I see myself as an artist, technologist, scientist, practitioner at the end. And I often think about my, my practice and, and how it relates to the field of data visualization. So the challenges of developing visualizations for scientific and broad audiences may lay outside the strict academic barriers that fields and academic institutions build on purpose and requires to consciously engage, I think, in two sets of practice. On my end, I'm very interested in developing original works that serve the NASA as an agency and the public that uh, follow transparency, paired with openness and synthesis. And, and in reality, if you think about it, it is quite challenging to establish and even more so teach them as they might be viewed more like social accomplishments and investments. And synthesis, I see myself as a synthesizer, bringing in skills from multiple fields and also collaborating with uh, experts, um, either they are scientists or modelers uh, or visualizers or programmers or designers uh, in a way that yield novel insights or explanations. It is a distinct form of research and practice and can take place across disciplines and professional sectors. Um, and of course, as, as an artist, um, you know, I think the using, using art and bringing in art in data visualization, it's really a superpower, but we often forget to think about it. And as visualization expert, I think it is part of our practice to simplify, clarify, and guide our audiences to the messages and truths revealed by research and data. And since the problems and data that we're called to tackle upon are becoming uh, increasingly more complex, this might require us to develop and explore new ways of doing and new ways of seeing in order to allow our audiences to respond with new ways 
of experiencing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eleni. Um, uh, again, I, uh, I'll jump in just for a moment and thank you for showing uh, Dan Sandine uh, uh, image processor. Uh, I'll just note, I, I had a, a longtime collaborator and friend, a man named Jim Wiseman, who died a couple of years ago. Uh, and he uh, had a Pike Abe system that he built at Cal Arts uh, under Shube Abe and Namjoon Pike. And he also had a Sandine image processing system that he built uh, uh, working with Dan Sandine at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And uh, two years ago, we uh, refurbished the Sandine system that Jim had in uh in Kauai on the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, that system is now, uh, uh, it was, we donated that system to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago to a new uh, analog digital uh, laboratory rather than just uh, preserving the system and having it sit on a shelf. Uh, it, it will be used by young people learning to play uh, in the uh, fields of uh, analog and digital imaging and uh, processing. So I, I, I've always been fascinated with those uh, systems. And uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. I, I, I would love to see thank so much so. more. I would love to see more. And I have a lot of questions, but I wanna, uh, actually I'll ask one and then I wanna open this up to the group uh, for some discussion. Uh, but I'm really interested in the education, you know, what are sort of next phase uh, steps for your lab, for the NASA facility, in terms of providing information, data, imagery, uh, uh, and even collaboration uh, with uh, schools and universities, uh, especially young people. I think this kind of work really just resonates with young people. Uh, who, you know, don't have to be uh, taught to be visually literate. They just have emerged as uh, being uh, visually lit, more visually literate, more sonic, more sonically literate and, and, uh, uh, and such. So I, I'm, I'm looking at what you're doing. And I'm thinking, what a great resource to be shared. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, first of all, um... The, all the work that we have been doing for the Earth Information Center is open and publicly available. Uh, this is sort of like the, the, the primary pillar of our work. Um, we are currently working on the infrastructure to improve the access to everything, make it easier. Uh, the data visualizations are available from our group website, G the um, svs.gsfc.nasa.gov. And, but also I'm making the data dashboards available for science centers, uh, museums, I'm porting them to different systems, um, just to give you an overview. In addition, um, within, uh, I think by next week or by mid August, we are gonna be opening a location uh, with a bigger hyperwall at the Smithsonian, at the National Museum of Natural History, with a, a 28 feet wide hyperwall display, which basically will allow over 5 million people a year, including students, to, to, to go and see the work, uh, right, as they visit the museum. In addition also, we are planning, uh, we are building um, a facility at the at the Kennedy Space Visitor Center, an entire building um, that will include immersive experience in immersive experiences, interactive installations, and the hyperwall um, to basically educate and engage um, audiences of different ages uh, about how our planet is changing. So there are multiple efforts. 
Um, I'm collaborating with multiple institutions, with multiple agencies. And also one more thing that I just uh, remembered, Dava Newman yesterday during the keynote, she shared the Earth Mission Control virtual reality application. Uh, the content that uh, the application, the data visualizations uh, that are featured in Davos and the MIT Media Lab Earth Mission Control are all developed by our group. So we are providing these visualizations to, to Dava and her team. We have been collaborate, uh, collaborating closely with her. And one more thing, just because I'm sure I'm forgetting many others, but um, also last week, um, the American Museum of Natural History uh, revamped their Hall of Planet Earth, uh, where they have a gigantic tile display, even a wider aspect ratio format than ours. And um, I have been working with them uh, to provide visualizations and the strategy for the dashboards. And they have adapted, I would say, um, our data dashboards for their exhibit. Uh, so it is um, a challenging effort, but definitely a worthwhile one. And uh, and this is Earth imaging and Earth data. Uh, and so the question comes to mind, how much international cooperation exists and what are next steps in terms of real international cooperation, since this isn't just a national issue? Yes, uh, that's a very good question, Richard. And there are two ways to think about that. Uh, one is, first of all, where the data is coming from, right? So when we provide, when we, in our dashboards, typically we provide, we have, we have each dashboard has multiple stages, what I call. So typically we provide also the global scale. Um, uh, and then we go to the national scale and sometimes we go also to localized um, uh, regions. But um, if you think about the data, data come from, well, let's, let's, let's categorize them in three major sources, okay? This is not complete, but let's, let's put them in three big, big buckets. One is satellite observations. Uh, two is, is from models right, that they run on supercomputers typically. And three, they are ground observations, ground measurements. Um, so if you think about the satellites, right, the even the NASA satellites or NOAA satellites uh, typically uh, are, are brought to life, maintained and operated uh, under international agreements. So either we're pulling from the NASA slash JAXA, the Japanese agency satellite, or we are pulling from geostationary satellites, or we are pulling from, you know, uh, NOAA satellites. Typically, all these are done with international, uh, co under international cooperation and agreement. So um, this is one part. Uh, but second, um, we are also, for example, we uh, recently I brought to life a data dashboard about disasters, and we are looking disasters on a global scale, um, and we are using APIs and tools from United Nations and the European Union. It doesn't really we don't see it as an only national um, effort. Uh, we want to provide um, views in a global scale national scale for U.S. and for some themes, U.S., we see U.S. and Canada, for example, for fires. And then, uh, but, and now we are thinking also how we create localized experiences, regional data as well. I hope, uh, I hope this helps a little bit with uh, um, framing the international um, effort. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up. I hope uh, others uh, that are online here uh, have some comments, some questions. Uh, our participants, uh, Everardo, any any thoughts? Oh, is Everardo. Oh, there's Everardo. Yeah, here we are. Well, where to start? Thank you very much for first, Richard, for putting us together this afternoon and uh, I'm sorry that I have not been listening to all the talks. I've seen many 
uh, the name of many friends in your series of conferences this week until next Friday, I guess. So, uh, no, of course, I, I do have many, many, many questions. Um, perhaps, uh, and I was cu curious also to, 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 I would like to also only to mention that I just met Eleni yesterday also for the first time. Uh, almost by chance, because it happens that I am a very close friend with a, a colleague of Eleni. So we were... We just met at, at Sigra, which is very amazing because there are 7,000 people uh, attendees uh, these days. No, I, I, I wanted to say that um, in, in, in respect to visualization, right? Because, I mean, that was uh, a, a, a strong focus uh, of uh, Eleni's presentation, maybe. Um, I would also like to, to, to add that um, it's a question also maybe or a comment um, that indeed uh, I, I, I had this question listening to some art papers and some talks here at SIGGRAPH as well. We are of course very interested in climate change for instance and uh, I just wanted to also to say that in my presentation, in my talk, in my slides, I of course did this did on purpose to say that there are only 16 papers or contributions that have the keywords science and or scientific but that's that was of course a provocation right it was it was like reducing the complete and the the complexity of what is the vocabulary that takes takes us to 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 science and to all the disciplines and or it depends how we want to understand science, of course, from the instruments, from the, the visualization, from the which point of view. Anyhow, in one of those sessions, we were talking about climate change as well. And one of the things was, how can we um, pass the message? How can we uh, um, create uh, an aesthetic experience for a viewer or for the public or for somebody to um, uh, indeed perceive the importance of thinking about issues, right? In this case, again, climate change. So I was wondering what uh, else, what have you been doing? What does it imply? What would be the next steps in visualizing data? We know that there's also data sonification, data physicalization, data, any sense of human, I mean, uh, faculties, features, it's possible. We were also thinking that, well, is that useful? Or is that logical to think that sometimes a data sensibilization, like, okay, it depends on which cultures where we are, some symbols do work, like, it's easy to say, okay, where you see blue, it's it means that it's cold. Where you see it's red, it means that it's high temperatures. But w of course, we are not all the same, right? We 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 do have some accessibility issues. We might need to do visualizations by night, of course. And uh, so what what would be your your thoughts about that we were it's an open question right i mean i i ask myself that question every time and that's something that i've been trying to do as richard said as well from the pedagogical perspective in my case with water like trying to uh, motivate students to think about what what's their own relationship with with, with water with their own words or I mean, language, right? Image or sound. Yes, yes. All these are great questions. We are thinking about all these questions. We are experimenting with multiple things on the same time. Um, I, we're gonna we're gonna show actually tomorrow um, what we have been and we're going to give a glimpse on what we have been working towards um so there are multiple things here right uh areas so 
to think about how you you scale this and we bring this to everyone. Um, we have been making these data dashboards and the content available online. Uh, we're trying to make them interactive online. Um, but also um, on the same time, how do we interact in different ways and modalities with the data dashboards and the content? that works for multiple people, right? Not just for one. And then how do we create uh, interactive installations and immersive experiences that actually dive a little bit deeper on these um, themes like sea level rise, right? And educate, and then also engage audiences to participate. Uh, so that at the end, right, which is the story that you like best? The story that you craft yourself. So um, all these are things that we're thinking about. We have started experimenting with multiple areas, content, design, immersion, workflows, pipelines, in order to... At the end, what do we want to do? We wanted to create the best experience possible so that we pass and share these messages and engage the public on multiple levels. Um, I have to say we started as a very small team. Uh, the first six months, we were only four people working 100% on this project. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, wow. now the team... Uh, I, I brought in multiple partnerships, collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a matter also of, you know, how do we scale? Uh, how do we, we also portray? Uh, it's very important for me also in these data dashboards and the content to portray um, the different federal agencies the right way. Right. I mean, we had to start this as NASA because somebody had to do the first step. We were tasked to do the launch. We were tasked to figure out the infrastructure and the pipelines and what the content could look like for the first phases. But now um, also the challenge is how do we bring all these different data? How do we make um, useful information? for the public and how do we serve it to them on multiple levels uh, here let me jump in for a second i think uh everado that's those are all i put a lot of my questions here i've been working with the allosphere on sensorium uh, for a few years so when i saw your dashboard i think last year or the year before we use that also as kind of a, a precedent. Uh, we have an advantage with our $12 million facility here because people are already immersed. So they see we have a partner that did sea level rise and they represented San Francisco and they represented different parts of the world. But it's interesting how narrative played a role because sometimes data is dry unless you find a way to get children and adults and families to speak to each other. So when I hear the dashboards, to me, that's a really good, um, it's a really good way to create curiosity. But I think we're looking at the idea of interaction and possibly this gamification, like how do you get children to be curious because they've been told everything is okay and safe in our world. But if you're a researcher, you know that data in the US has a different resolution than European data or data from countries that don't really have data because they're not required to have data. So Helen, how, how in your project, I know that NASA has a certain level or quality of data but what resolution can you get to? Can you get to the mile level? Can you get to the 10 square mile level? I know that NVIDIA did a project where they use machine learning to have a certain type of resolution. 
are you guys working with universities or let's say NVIDIA uh, in their world uh, research project? How are you looking at tying all these potential partnerships together? Oh, and you're invited also to Santa Barbara and we would love you. We would love your data to be inside the Allosphere for sure. And I'm sure Joanne would extend a warm invitation. But um, I think those are hard questions that we've had. It's like we want to save the world, but we don't know how because there's so many potential pitfalls or gaps of information. So Helen, sorry to. No, yeah, all these, all these are excellent questions, comments. Um, it is an overwhelming task, right? I mean, I have to be honest, when the when it first was introduced to me, um, I kind of freaked out uh, that I had to carry that that yeah. torch, right? Yeah. Uh, but on the same time, you start from somewhere, right? Uh, you, you start from somewhere and then um, folding lessons learned, and as you as you develop as you grow um uh i want i want to get feedback so that uh, i can scale operations i can scale development i can do better work right at the end of the day for for the agency and the public um we are so collaboration is happening on multiple levels collaboration is happening on how satellites operate, how data products are developed, um, how models are improved. And then on the data visualization side, I have been collaborating with Fanny Sevalier and Benjamin Bach from the visualization community mm. because um, when I was first asked to develop data dashboards, uh, our group had never done data dashboards. We developed high-end yeah. uh, computer um, animations uh, using Hollywood-like tools uh, yeah, yeah. like Pixar and Houdini. So um, uh, I read, I accessed the literature, um, dived into data dashboards, and then started discussing with Benjamin Bach and Fanny Sevalier because they had written some great papers. So we are collaborating, and um, they're also going to, uh, Fanny is going to present with us tomorrow. Um, and we're working also on some of these experiments, right? These questions. Yeah. Can yeah. how can we make them better? Can we create immersion and immersive environments? So what would they look like? Uh, can we improve the workflows too? Right. So um we are also open to other collaborations. Uh we want to um basically engage the community to work with us, join us in this effort. Yeah. Uh, I'm We're putting together a visualization workshop also at VIS 2024. Okay. Uh, I started doing that in VIS 2022 because as a practitioner, yeah. I have to say, um, I'm curious. I want to know what is the latest and greatest uh, findings from the research community right yeah. um so i'm not sure if that answers yeah uh, the question uh, well H helen just one thing uh, just to let you know a lot of the kids and adults want to have scenarios built into their world so we've actually looked at speaking with the top ai scientists at ucsb and around our community but how are you guys making tools for speculation? Like um, we actually have an AI that you can act, uh, that you can speak to, but the data is not reliable. And what you're gonna get is gibberish. So how do you keep the integrity of the science and still use these speculative tools to create learning opportunities? Have you thought about using AI and machine learning and what you're doing? Yes, we've thought about that. Okay. <laughs> um, we would love to engage uh, large language models, for example, also, yeah. right? Um, 
currently, so we have been experimenting mostly with AI on the, on the, we have been using AI to assist us in the development, mm. right? Um, currently, there isn't uh, a policy um, for the U.S. federal agencies for uh, for the use of AI with data. Um, so we are waiting for that. Um, on our end, as data visualizers, uh, we we aim for. Um, products that have scientific integrity yep. and data accuracy. So mm -hmm. it is important to wait for that directive yep. on the use of AI. Uh, but I think it is an area in general on the experimentation, right? Um, that is bound to happen pretty soon. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where's yeah, if, if 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 I may, because that's that I was indeed thinking about more or less the same thing about the speculative speculation and the speculative thinking, and uh, I like to think or I I I mean I mean I've been satisfied with <laughs> thinking that that's where also the collaboration of artists, designers, and uh, experimental research or even uh, teaching activities it's uh, uh, good however of course we do have this um contrast or i mean we do have to like find or tune the same discourse that we that means that we we do need that i mean let's say students are willing to play the game that they want to say okay right i got it I know why speculation is important. I will engage with the teaching activity. So in my in my in my in my experience, when I say, hey, let's try to do something original, something different, different, let's not use the same tools that we use to do a data visualization. So then you say, okay, monsieur, so what 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 can we do? If we don't want if you don't want us to use the same tools, I say, okay. In France, you know, we have been a part of a part of the social sciences have been influenced by Bruno Latour, and uh, he has been questioning from the philosophy of sciences, science studies, how scientific knowledge is, um, let's say, documented or uh, spread or or archived i mean how is it not done because that's another thing it's going to the field work and things like that but then how is it um let's say published or uh, written or uh, recorded right so that that's we that's when we need like a a layer of translation from the nature that's that's that I think that's the importance of the the indeed the the title of this series of of the conference that Richard uh, came nature of information that's that's yeah. super important because let me say it like this if it sounds like provocative okay but <laughs> we are used to of course our own language we need to um, quantify of course some natural phenomena and to understand them from our own human scale, right? Okay, using our languages of way, our senses, okay. But when we think about speculation, speculative thinking, it's about like trying to say, hey, dear students, why don't we do a visualization? What would it be for a cow, a fly, an insect to feel our impact in the world? And when they say, Yes, but why? Why would I would like to do that if, if I don't? And I said, well, you know, and that's really my question that I asked to this morning to Manu Prakash. I said, well, what is our impact, our human species, in the microscopic world, in the, these new microorganisms? That I mean, are we conscious that? What would be the impact of a human, even if we are not here? Or, you know, I am really thinking far. It's just speculation, you know, but you made me think about that. Yes, Richard. Well, uh, actually, um, I'm just full of uh, thoughts about all of this. 
uh, it's an area that I've been fascinated with. Uh, actually, I started playing as a young artist designer. I started, I approached NASA Ames uh, originally back 50 years ago, 1974, uh, especially about uh, multispectral imaging, uh, mm -hmm. terrestrially and in space. Uh, and I mean, that, that's fascinating area. Also, I'll just mention, uh, just on Saturday, one of our presenters was Dan Goods, who you will see at SIGGRAPH uh, either virtually or in, probably virtually tomorrow, uh, unless he shows up in Denver, I don't know. Um, but Dan did a wonderful little presentation about uh, some communication uh, art works uh, on a European satellite, uh, a European uh, system that's being launched soon. Um, but um, just the just uh, I think it was yesterday we had a, a wonderful session as part of the art science uh, series here on uh, the sounds and senses of life, and uh, uh, we talked about uh, there are so many artists now who are working with sensing systems, uh, small electronics, but also now photonic sensing systems. Photonics presents a whole new. Uh, uh, area of uh, uh, information processing and display and and even the uh, the logic systems behind uh, the processing uh, because photonics moves beyond digital uh, because of the nature of light. And I think a lot of people are still setting up digital labs when we're actually moving beyond digital to other means of processing and understanding. And I find that really amazing. Uh, uh, one of my biggest concerns has been uh, the impact of digital logic, the binary Boolean logic, on not on technology, but on society. More and more of our society is bureaucratized because of digitization of processes. Um, we are also seeing a social um, almost an ignorance because of information overload. People are withdrawing from attempts to understand and, and are relying on uh, personal beliefs at best uh, rather than data and factual information and an attempt to understand truth, uh, which is a big ethical issue that we face with AI and so on. But uh, yesterday, we had some great presentations on uh, including the application of AI now to the vocalizations and communication of whales, of ants, of bees, of plants. Uh, there's some remarkable work going on. And we already know, even though we don't understand the meaning of much of this communication, that there are, in the animal kingdom especially, um, Unique languages, in fact, and and uh, very uh, special songs, for instance, among whale, you know, uh, cetacea among whales, um, which are uh, carried across the planet uh, from one ocean to another, and they vary in terms of the response to those vocalizations. Uh, and it's just fascinating to me what might be communicated there about temperature of the water or uh, all sorts of other environmental sensing by living creatures that we share this planet with. Uh, that Yeah, the other day the presentation was wonderful. We're coming to a close of this one as well right now. And I do want to mention, we can keep talking, but I do want to just for those uh, listening in or watching that uh, tomorrow we have a uh, I think a really fascinating, all of these 12 lasers, uh, laser zoom programs we've been doing uh, and still have uh, a few to do. Uh, tomorrow we have one with a group called Artists with Evidence. That's uh, mm -hmm. a, a really fascinating group I've encountered earlier this year. Uh, and they're primarily uh, a couple of people are based at the Alvar Alto University in uh, Helsinki, Finland. Uh, also in New York and elsewhere. And they're going to be joined tomorrow by a friend of mine from Africa, from Cameroon, uh, Issa Niafaga, yeah. who uh, has his own take on the nature of information, 
Uh, he grew up, uh, I'll give a little background on this so uh, people tune in maybe, but uh, he has a unique perspective on information. Uh, he was a, he grew up in a rural tribal community. Islamic religion permeated that area. His father had seven wives. Children grew up with mothers and the women were separate from the men in the village. And the children don't know which of the women are their actual biological mothers often. They just, the children are with the mothers, the fathers are with their various other wives. And uh, Isa luckily had an education, got, had opportunity to be educated mm -hmm. and became a political cartoonist. He's an artist and the most uh, beautiful personality. Uh, and he was imprisoned and tortured for political cartooning in Cameroon. He was uh, uh, released with the help of some French human rights groups uh, mm. and taken to Paris, where he was part of the Charlie Hebdo group, okay. just at the time of their terrorist assassinations. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think tomorrow's session uh, with artists with evidence and East and the Apaga is going to be just revelatory uh, in terms of how we think about the social consequences of you know, addressing real vital issues in our world, the politics, the economics, the quality of life among yeah. so many people in an inequitable world. Uh, I, I sense there's a, a tremendous amount of inequity uh, that affects the kind of work we're talking about right here. Uh, you know, being informed about the earth. Many places don't- Five minutes, we're closing. Many places don't want that information shared or made sure. public and sure. and don't believe a uh, terrible terrible concept this notion of belief uh especially when not based on anything other than personal preferences uh yeah. or ide ideologies um well, and I, I, we have some noise here behind me yeah uh, i just do... wanted to i just wanted to so, just some closing words from gustavo from eleni from and then we'll close down. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say when I met Richard, I basically said why I'm doing research. Um, basically, in the last few years in Santa Barbara, we've been evacuated by fires twice. We've had mudslides, mudslides that have killed people in Montecito, one of the richest zip codes in the United States. Um, pandemic, start seeing nature re like. Uh, birthing new life because human beings aren't impacting the earth without regard. You see the injustice everywhere where I live in California. So I think a lot of what uh, I'm passionate about with climate is knowing that I think I can survive well, but uh, I am sure that there's others that are suffering much, much more. And I'm very privileged to have an education. I'm privileged to have a $12 million facility at UCSB. I'm privileged to be a researcher, but I worry about the kids. I worry about those families. That's what gets me up in the morning. And that's what, when I go to sleep, I want to do better for everyone. So I wanted to thank Helen, Everardo, and Richard, especially for the invitation and Tomiko as well. But thank you very much. All right, I'm going to thank you, and we're going to shut this down for today. And, uh, oh, a last invitation here to all of you, and, and I'll get to Everardo also, but on Friday, uh, we're having the last session, uh, also this time, uh, uh, yeah, Friday afternoon, we have another session, our time zones, um, and it's going to be an information commons, just an open session for a conversation beyond the conversations we've been having for any participant uh, that wants to join us. So you're all invited. If you have the time, if you have the interest, join us on Friday. I'll send you a follow-up email uh, uh, to ask if you're going to join us, but you're welcome to join us for an open conversation that digs deeper into the nature of information especially as Gustavo just mentioned, we're not going to be able to address climate. We're not going to be able to address our economic uh, disparities. We're not going to be able to address so many things unless we also uh, have a clearer and more 
broadly open-minded understanding of the nature of information, it's critical to address the other grand challenge issues. Uh, and there's so many. And I think uh, we're off to, I, I'm optimistic actually. Uh, uh, I'm an elder and I probably won't see how this all plays out, but uh, I, I'm quite optimistic uh, about possibilities and uh, as quantum uh, processing people would say probabilities. Uh, Everardo? No, just a brief thing, just to my last words before uh, Helen, Eleni, maybe, but is that uh, perhaps Ricardo Dalfara already mentioned this, but it happens that I am also in the board of AICEA that you mentioned and Gustavo as well. And I just wanted to say that that's also uh, in, re in relation to the move to enhance the name, the acronym of AICEA into International Symposium of Emer Emerging Arts, not only electronic arts, but emerging arts, to try to cope, try to broaden the perspective. That That's only, thank you very much, and it's very generous for Friday. I'm going to be on a plane, but uh, I really hope to, to, to catch you later. Yes, have a great time at SIGGRAPH. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. It's bye. wonderful to meet you all. Thank you so much. And I look to continuing our conversations and working together, hopefully, in the future. Everyone's invited to Santa Barbara in the Allosphere. Oh, I would love to come. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.